The night sky is amazing. What do you think is out there? Beyond the moon? The planets? Galaxies? Aliens? Well, let's go! Five, Four, three, three two, two, one. one. Lift off. NBC Connecticut's Kids Connection goes to space. Proudly brought to you by Aces. Hi kids, thanks for tagging along as NBC Connecticut's Kids Connection goes to space. I'm NBC Connecticut Storm Tracker Meteorologist Rochelle J, and today we're exploring the extraterrestrial, discovering Connecticut connections to astronomy and enjoying some out of this world activities and fun. Did you know that the Earth is about to experience a very special event? On April 8th, we'll be able to witness the amazing sight that is a total solar eclipse. These phenomena only happen so often, and I'm here at the Truragy Planetarium at the Mystic Seaport Museum to learn more about them. So come along as we learn all about eclipses. This is Brian Kohler. He's the supervisor of the Truragy Planetarium at the Mystic Seaport Museum, and he is very excited about the upcoming eclipse. So what's going to happen on the day of the eclipse is the moon in its orbit around the Earth will actually get in between the Earth and the sun. We're used to seeing the sun in the sky every day, the sunlight shining down on Earth. But if the moon were to get in the way, it would actually put us into a little bit of a shadow. Now let's break that down again. A solar eclipse involves three objects, the Earth, the moon, and of course, the sun. When the sun is shining, we all see our shadows on the ground, and that's what's happening during a solar eclipse, but on a much larger scale. So our moon, it orbits around the Earth, and when the eclipse happens, the moon's path lines up perfectly between the sun and our planet, and therefore the moon casts its shadows on us. Now, as the Earth rotates, the moon's shadow travels across the planet, so there's a path where the sun will be totally covered, and this is called the path of totality. Now, here in Connecticut, it's not gonna be a 100% total eclipse, so what I've been describing for visitors is they can expect to see, it's sort of like a crescent sun. A solar eclipse happens on average about once every 18 months, but then it's a matter of where is that eclipse? Sometimes it's over Antarctica or sometimes it's in the middle of the Atlantic. And uh, this one is unique because it really cuts across North America. Connecticut has been in the middle of that path of totality before, all the way back in 1925, and then before then, even further back in 1806. A solar eclipse is one of two types of eclipses. The other is called a lunar eclipse. And that is what happens when the Earth blocks the sunlight, casting a shadow on the moon, and the moon actually appears red. And as a fun note, lunar eclipses tend to happen within a few weeks before or after a solar eclipse. So it's the same three objects, but arranged in a different order, like this. Now that we know what an eclipse is, we're definitely gonna wanna check one out for ourselves. But we do have to take some extra precautions to protect our eyes when we watch it happen. Now my friend, Storm Tracker meteorologist Anthony Carpino is here to show us how we can safely enjoy the solar eclipse. Check it out. Hey kids, I'm NBC Connecticut Storm Tracker meteorologist Anthony Carpino. We have a pretty cool event coming up, a total solar eclipse. Now, if you're going to try to go see the eclipse, the best way to do that is going to be with a pair of eclipse glasses. The solar filter blocks the harmful light that can cause damage to your eyes. So if you're staying in Connecticut or will be in an area that will not see totality, be sure to keep your glasses on the entire time. Oh, and sunglasses won't do the trick. So what do you do if you don't own a pair of Eclipse glasses? Well, my buddy Theo and I, he's joining me here in the kitchen set. We're going to build our very own pinhole projector. We got a shoe box here. Theo has his cereal box. And yeah, we're going to show you guys how to do this. In addition to your box of choice, for this project, you'll need scissors, aluminum foil, a pencil or pen, a push pin, tape, and a sheet of paper. First, trace your box on a piece of paper. Then, cut out what you've traced. 
Ask a grown-up for help with the scissors. After that, place your cut piece of paper inside the box so that it lays flat against the closed end of the box. Next, cut two holes at the opposite end of the box, leaving a section in the middle. Again, be careful and ask for help if you need it. Next, add some tape for support, especially if you have a cereal box. During a solar eclipse, sometimes you're just like, why can't you just purely look at the sun? It's because when the moon is covering the sun, it can blind you. But when you're doing stuff like this, it blocks all the light that you need to be blocked. So you got two holes on either side. Now, one of those holes we want to cover up, so we're going to use some of the tin foil. So do you just... Yep, just straight down. After you cover one of the openings, carefully use a push pin to poke a small hole in the foil. And that is going to allow just enough light to pass through it, and it will actually project the shadow of what the, the sun looks like inside in the box. Of the box. In the box, exactly. Now, it doesn't work too well inside, even with the lights that we have. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to go outside. We're going to have to test it out. All right, so now that our pinhole projector is put together, we had to come outside to test it out for ourselves. It's a nice, bright, sunny day now. In order for this to work, we actually going to have to turn around and have the sun on our back. That way, the sun will go right through the hole, and we'll be able to figure it out. So let's test it out here. Light from the sun enters the hole and will display a circle of light on the back of the box. But that changes into a crescent shape as the eclipse continues. This same process happens when looking at shadows from tree leaves. All right, so we're back inside. It was pretty bright out there, but I think these worked pretty good. What'd you think? I thought they worked really well. It was very clear. It doesn't hurt your eyes and it just worked really well. Yeah, no, it definitely did. I was actually surprised too, just how well you could see that circle uh, on, on the back of the screen there. So it worked really well. You know, there's a couple different ways to see the eclipse. You know, we brought up making these boxes. Uh, you can use the eclipse glasses, but you can also use, if you're a big space fan, you might have this already, either a pair of binoculars or a telescope, but you definitely want to make sure that there is a solar filter on there so you can see the sun clearly and it's not going to hurt your eyes. Uh, but have some fun with it. And of course, happy viewing. Hey kids, I'm NBC Connecticut Storm Tracker Meteorologist Bob Maxson. Our moon plays a big role in the solar eclipse. But did you also know that the moon plays a big role in affecting other things right here on Earth? Our moon's gravity is directly responsible for the ocean's changing tides that we see every day. These tides then impact the ocean currents, which play a big part in all the weather we experience, influencing the temperature, our wind, and storms. So you could say our moon, in a way, helps make our weather. Isn't that super cool? Now, there's no wind up there on the moon. So because there's no wind, when the astronauts landed, their footprints will actually stay up there forever or until the next person or rover comes along and leaves a new mark permanently on the moon. Still ahead on Kids Connection, we're going galactic with a fun paint and glitter filled art project you can do at home. Then, have you ever wanted to talk to an astronaut? CT Live's Taylor Kinsler introduces you to one. And before we get a break, check out some of the awesome alien creations imagined by kids just like you. If you want to get in on the extraterrestrial fun, have a grown-up log on to NBCConnecticut.com slash Kids Connection or scan the QR code on screen to download our free activity sheets and let your creativity take flight. Then take a picture of your finished artwork and send it to share it at NBCConnecticut.com. You could see your masterpiece on air or on our NBC Connecticut social media pages. Don't go away. NBC Connecticut's Kids Connection will be right back in just one minute. Watching Kids Connection Goes to Space on NBC Connecticut. Hi, kids. I'm Storm Tracker meteorologist Darren Sweeney. Our sun is called the star. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, has a whole lot of stars. However, there is a thing we call a star that actually isn't, and those are shooting stars. Now, what exactly is a shooting star? These are small space rocks and other pieces of debris that burn up high up in the atmosphere as they fall back to Earth. When that happens, it creates a streak of light called a shooting star. There are phenomenon called meteor showers, and like the weather, scientists can actually forecast when a meteor shower will occur. Pretty neat, right? Today, we're gonna make our own galaxy. This quick and easy craft is truly out of this world. 
Here's everything you'll need to make your galaxy. First fill your cup halfway with water and add a few drops of your first color. Mix the water and paint with your pencil. <laughs> it's all filled. Then repeat for the last two colors. Fill in your mason jar a quarter of the way with cotton balls. We pulled our cotton balls apart so they would fill up more of the jar. Sprinkle in your glittering stars along the sides of the jar. Slowly pour your lightest paint color. You want your cotton balls to completely absorb the paint water. Don't worry if you pour in too much, you can always add more cotton balls. Continue these steps for each paint color. We're doing ours lightest to darkest, but you could choose any order you like. Use your pencil to push around some of the colors and stars. Finally, screw on your lid tightly and enjoy your mini galaxy. This one's really cool. I like this one. This is so cool. This one has like the blue and like the purple. Like. Hi kids, I'm Storm Tracker Chief Meteorologist Ryan Hanrahan. Do you ever look up to see all the stars in the night sky? In space, stars, like our sun, along with planets and big clouds of gas and dust, form systems that are held together by gravity. And those groups are called galaxies. Earth, where we live, is part of the Milky Way galaxy. Did you know that the Milky Way alone is estimated to contain 100 to 400 billion stars? That's a lot, isn't it? But only a few thousand of those can actually be seen with our own eyes. And what's really neat is that on clear nights, you can look up and see groups of stars that appear to be forming a figure or a design in the sky. These are known as constellations. Many have legendary stories behind them, and how some of them got their names dates all the way back to ancient Greece. Today, astronomers officially recognize 88 different constellations, and right now, we'll take a closer look at two of them that are the most well-known. But to do that, we're going to have to turn off the studio lights and use our cool technology to bring the stars and constellations to life. Let's count to three together and then snap our fingers to make it really dark in here. Ready? One, two, three. Lights out. Awesome job. Let's see the first one. Here we have Ursa Major. The name is Latin meaning Great Bear. It's the largest constellation in the Northern Hemisphere and the third largest in the sky overall. In part of Ursa Major, we find one of the most recognizable star patterns called the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is actually an asterism, not a constellation. An asterism is a group of stars with a popular name, but it's much smaller than an entire constellation. The shape of the Big Dipper looks like a kind of kitchen ladle that your grown-ups might use to cook with, doesn't it? Okay, let's look at one more constellation you may have heard of before. This one is called Orion, and it's named after a famous hunter in Greek mythology. The easiest way to spot Orion on a clear night is to look for three bright stars appearing close together and almost in a straight line. That's called Orion's Belt. These supergiant stars are much bigger in size than our sun, and even though they seem close together, they're actually trillions of miles apart from each other in outer space. Okay, ready to turn the lights back on? Let's snap together on the count of three. Here we go, one, two, three. Let there be light. So kids, I hope you enjoyed learning about constellations with me. The next time you go stargazing, see if you can spot Ursa Major and Orion, and then tell your friends that you learned about them right here on Kids Connection. Oh, and if you're up for a challenge, with the help of a grown-up, research some of the other constellations and see if you can find them in the night sky too. Coming up on Kids Connection, we meet a spacewalking, shuttle-flying astronaut from Connecticut. And kids just like you, taste test some astronaut food. Stick around, Kids Connection will be right back after this.
for watching Kids Connection Goes to Space on NBC Connecticut. Hey kids, it's Taylor Kinsler from CT Live. Today we are at the New England Air Museum with a very special guest, Waterbury's own Rick Mastracchio. He is an engineer, a former astronaut, and has flown on three NASA space shuttle missions. We are so excited to welcome you back to Connecticut today. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Taylor. So happy to be here. So I have to know, let's go back to the beginning. When did your interest in space first start? Yeah, obviously when I was very young, the Apollo lunar landings were taking place. And I have vague memories of those, you know, being at my grandparents' house and, and watching it on black and white fuzzy TV. But I really don't think the interest really peaked until maybe when I was in college, when I really gained this interest to fly airplanes. Mm -hmm. And the space shuttle program was attempting the lift off for the first time. I remember getting up at 5 a.m. in the morning and in my dorm room and my roommate would be, why are you up so early? I said, this is history. I want to watch the first space shuttle fly in space. Now you went to UConn, right? For I engineering. went to the University of Connecticut, Storrs Campus for electrical engineering and computer science. Rick went to work for NASA and helped design and build all kinds of systems for the space shuttle. Then he was selected by NASA to be an astronaut. And after two years of intense training, he was ready to go into space never flown in space before, I was told, hey, you're gonna be the flight engineer, you're gonna be the primary robotics operator, you're gonna do this, you're gonna do that, and you've got six months to train it. The mission was very, very successful, and NASA was happy with it, and we had a blast doing it. Were you nervous? You know, people ask me that a lot, and I really am not, and the, the analogy I use is, if you practice, 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 you've got a test, and you study for your test for days and days, and you know your material, when you go take that test, it's like, I got this. And that's a great lesson for kids at home as yeah. well about the power of preparation. Preparation takes away all that stress. Mm -hmm. We've got to talk about the spacewalks. The spacewalks. Did walks, you just yeah. feel like a superhero? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, when you're in space, just in space, so you go up inside the space shuttle, and the space shuttle is a pretty roomy, roomy spacecraft, and you are now, you're free floating. Yeah. So you're flying like Superman or like Spider-Man. <laughs> you're able to lift up thousands of pounds, you know, like Superman. You're able to, you're, go, you're traveling around the world in 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're traveling at 25,000 feet per second, 17,500 miles an hour. The preparation for a spacewalk takes three, four, five hours. Actually, it starts the night before. You have to get all the nitrogen out of your body because it's almost like, a, like pre preparing like a scuba diver would. Okay. You suit up in the suit uh, like you see behind us, you open up the hatch, you go out the door and you work for about six or eight hours and you mm -hmm. come inside. The whole event is 12, 14 hour day without any food. All you're getting is water because you're trapped in a spacesuit most mm -hmm. of the time. But once you get out there, the views are just, now you're not constrained by the spacecraft. You're looking through, you're just a visor of your helmet and you have the most incredible views in the, in the history of, of anyone. Now, these kids, just like you, have some questions for Rick about being an astronaut. How does it feel to take off on a rocket? So launch on any spacecraft is a very dynamic event. You're sitting there for a couple hours preparing, and then finally, three, two, one, liftoff. And the vehicles, they just, the space shuttle especially, jumps off the launch pad. You're under this tremendous vibration, under this tremendous pressure. You're under that for about eight minutes, eight and a half minutes. And then all the main engines shut down and you go from being very, very heavy to weightless. And you just get to the zero G environment and then everything just floats up and flies off in, into, uh, into the cabin. How do you sleep in zero gravity? Sleeping in zero gravity is the best kind of sleep because when you sleep here on Earth, your arm might fall asleep because you're laying on it. You may get a sore neck. In zero gravity, everything is just floats. We hang our sleeping bag up on the wall or we hang our sleeping bag up on the ceiling or on the floor because there's no up and down in space. It doesn't matter where you hang your sleeping bag. You crawl in your sleeping bag and you kind of just go back and relax and you float and fall asleep. What's it like to come back from space? Whenever you go into space and then whenever you come back, your body goes through a lot of changes. When you go into space, you get a little taller, blood kind of fills up your head because gravity's not pulling blood down to your feet anymore. Then when you come back, you have to go through all those changes but in the opposite direction. You don't have enough fluid in your body. So before we come back, we try to drink a lot of water, get a lot of fluid so that when we come back, we're not dehydrated. And also you then go back to your normal size. So your body goes through a lot of changes in both directions. 
For more Kids Ask an Astronaut questions and to learn more about Rick Mastracchio's NASA career, go to NBCConnecticut.com slash Kids Connection. When astronauts are in outer space doing impressive scientific experiments, eventually they'll need a bathroom break. And we actually met the man who invented the space toilet, lovingly known as Dr. Flush. One bag for use, put the seat down. You gotta float over to it and hold yourself down. Otherwise, you may have a premature liftoff when you use the bathroom space. Oh, you're done? Hey, guys, put the lid down, save power. May the flesh be with you all. To check out our conversation with him, visit NBCConnecticut.com slash Kids Connection. Hi, kids. I'm NBC Connecticut storm tracker meteorologist Bob Maxson, back with some more awesome facts about space. Now that you've met an astronaut, let's talk about their home high above the Earth. It took hundreds of space flights, including NASA's space shuttle missions, to create the International Space Station, or ISS for short. This orbiting laboratory gives astronauts and scientists the chance to run experiments in low gravity and to learn how to live in space for a long time. And did you know the Olympic torch once visited the ISS? Ahead of the Sochi Olympics in 2014, our friend Rick Mastracchio was actually one of the astronauts tasked with delivering the torch. It even had the chance to take a spacewalk. How cool is that? After the break, what do astronauts eat at snack time? We give some outer space treats a try. But first, check out some great creations from local kids just like you. Kids Connection will be right back. You are watching Kids Connection Goes to Space on NBC Connecticut. What type of food do you eat in space? The food on the International Space Station can be very good. There's obviously, everybody has favorite things. I remember my favorite thing was the beef enchiladas. Every once in a while, we would run across one and I really enjoyed it. Just like anywhere else though, some of the food, you're, you have to eat sometimes things that are not your favorites, but uh, there's a wide variety and the food was, was pretty good in general. You're watching Kids Connection Goes to Space on NBC Connecticut. Welcome back to the show. Storm Tracker meteorologist Darren Sweeney here, again with some super cool space facts. This time, we're talking about one of our planetary neighbors right here on the solar system. Bob Maxson taught you about the moon, but did you know we've actually landed on Mars too? Well, we've sent machines to do the exploring for us, as Mars is the fourth planet from the sun and is about half the size of Earth. Our rovers have encountered dust storms on the red planet. We also know that the planet is much colder than Earth, and there's water in the form of ice visible at its own North Pole. Sure gets you thinking about what it'd be like to forecast weather around the solar system. But if you're looking to be a storm tracker like us, have your parent or guardian download the NBC Connecticut app so you can know the forecast right here at home. Hi everyone, I'm NBC Connecticut Response consumer reporter Caitlin Burchill. Have you ever wondered what astronauts eat in space? Well, in the early days of space travel, astronaut food was prepared with a process called dehydration. Can you say that? Dehydration. Dehydration is when water is actually removed from something. Astronaut food was dehydrated to reduce its weight and make it easier and lighter to transport while preserving most of its nutrients. One thing about dehydration is that it sometimes leaves food unrecognizable. We sent some of these dehydrated snacks to our pals at ACES to see if they could guess what this stuff is. What's the bucket for? Oh, uh, it's for anything nasty. We could spit it in there. Mmm, I don't know. <laughs> It's kind of cinnamony. I could taste some cinnamon. All right. I still don't know what it is. Yeah. I felt like I tasted it before. It's good. Mm, it tastes a little weird for me. It tastes like sweet styrofoam. Really? <laughs> Interesting. It tastes like a sugar cookie, but even more sugar. 
It honestly just tastes like a really sweet cracker. I'm gonna have to go with her. I think it's honestly like a cracker type food. I think it's cereal or something. Yeah, cereal. We're gonna tell you what it is. Appleton. <laughs> like, yeah. mm. It's a peach. This is peach? This tastes absolutely nothing like a peach. <laughs> See if you can guess by looking at it. Is it a pop tart? You're getting closer. Is it ice cream? There you go. <laughs> I kind of like it. Huh. It's kind of good. Now I have to give those kids a hand because I'm not sure I'd be brave enough to try some of that astronaut food. I think I'll stick with keeping my meals right here on Earth. But thank you so much for joining us for this space-themed adventure. And if you'd like to watch any of these segments again or check out some more awesome Kids Connection content, grab a grown-up and you can find it all on YouTube, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, the NBC Connecticut app, and of course, NBCConnecticut.com slash Kids Connection. We hope you had some fun and saw some things that will help take your imagination to the stars. Bye. Thanks for watching Kids Connection on NBC Connecticut. Proudly brought to you by ACES.